If you've got a large garden, an automated drip irrigation system is going to be crucial to your garden success. In this, our third part of our drip irrigation series, I'm going to be showing you how to design a valve-based irrigation system just like this one. And this is what you need for your larger gardens, like a larger backyard, a community garden, or an urban farm. first questions you might be asking yourself when you're getting started on a project like this is how difficult is it, how much time is it going to take, and is this something I can do myself? I would say that this is not a super difficult project. Um, I'm going to try to take all the difficulty and the mystery out of it through these videos and through this series. It is going to take some time depending on where you're starting from. If you already have a sprinkler system that you're going to convert into a drip system, that can be actually quite quick and not very difficult. If you're starting from scratch and you got to lay down all the, the mainline pipes and build the manifold and put the valves together and run it to the, run the electrical to the timer, it is going to be a project. It's for sure going to take some time, but I'm going to walk you through every single step here. So you will be able to do it. There's not a lot of tools involved. Um, you just got to know what parts to get, which I've already showed you all the different parts in the previous videos. And in the next video, I'll be showing you how to assemble. To know whether you can install an automated valve-based irrigation system, the first thing you're going to need to do is find a water main. And a water main is any pipe that has constant water in it, that has constant water pressure in it. And we can tap off of that and connect our valves to that main. So there's a couple ways to know if you have a main, if you have access to a main. One would be if you're in a residential property, you want to look for where does the water start coming into your house. So here in, at this residence, you can see this water is coming up from the, the city's water, from the sidewalk, and it's entering the house right here. And usually there's also a hose bib at that point. Uh, and that's the other way you can tell whether you have access to a water main is if you have a hose bib. A hose bib is always on a water main and you can tap in from that point. Today I'm not going to show you actually how to tap into the water main. I just want, to, want you to know that you need to have access to the water main to install one of these systems. So let's talk about now designing a drip irrigation system. So when I've mentioned the, the phrase valve based irrigation system, these are what I'm talking about. These are irrigation valves. And what's happening here is our water main, that's the pipe that has water in it constantly, is coming up to each one of these valves directly. So on the back side of the valve, there is constant water pressure. And then the water is released into the front side by the valve when it's triggered by our irrigation timer. So each one of these is, a, is attached to a separate area and it's going to irrigate in a separate area and that's what we call our station. So an irrigation station is controlled by an irrigation valve. And that's the main thing I'm going to talk about today. How to design your stations, how to decide what plants are going to go together in your irrigation system. So it might be that, you know, trees in this area are going to be on one station. Vegetable gardens in this area are going to be on one station. How do we make that decision of what plants to group together onto a single station, which is controlled by a single valve? As I mentioned, every valve in our irrigation system is controlled by our irrigation timer. And this here is our irrigation timer at, at our farm here. And what you see here is that there are a lot of different colored wires coming in to this irrigation timer. Each of those colored wires corresponds to a different valve out in the field. And this timer is what controls when those valves turn on and how long they turn on for. So a key thing to understand here is that every valve, whatever irrigation actual tubing or emitters are attached to an irrigation station, each station is attached to one valve, all of that drip emitters and tubing are going to turn on at the same time and for the same duration. So whatever we have on a station, we want those drip irrigations and tubings 
to be watering a similar type of plant because they're going to get watered at the same time and for the same duration. One thing you want to do before you actually plan out your stations is do a water flow test. This is going to tell you how much water is actually flowing through your mainline water pipe and how fast it's coming out, which will determine how much drip you can actually fit onto every station. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn this hose on full blast and I'm going to time how long it takes for the water to fill up this bucket. And then we'll do some calculations based on that to figure out how many drippers we can actually fit onto any individual station. So this four gallon bucket filled up in just over 10 seconds and if we divide four by 10, our gallons by our seconds, we get that this will, our flow rate was 0.4 gallons per second. If we multiply that by 60, we get the gallons per minute, which is 24 gallons per minute. And if we multiply that by 60 again, we get 1440, that's our gallons per hour, 1440 gallons per hour. So now we have our maximum flow rate that will be going through any individual station in our irrigation system. And based on that, we can figure out how many emitters of a specific type of emitter we can attach to that station. For example, on our emitter tubing, our drip emitter tubing, which I showed you a couple times in our last couple of videos, we have emitters that put out 0.6 gallons per hour. So 1,440 divided by 0.6, that's how many of those emitters we can run on an individual station. If we use our uh, stake emitters, which we have on our pots here, these put out about four gallons per hour, 1,440 divided by four, that's how many of those emitters we can run on an individual station. So you've got this big garden. How do you decide what to put on what station. Well, luckily for you here on our farm, we've got all the different types of plantings. We've got a vegetable garden, we have an orchard, we have California natives, we have nursery sprinklers, we have greenhouses. So I'm going to show you how I decided to divide up the irrigation at this farm, and that should pretty much show you how you're going to divide in your home or at your community garden or at your urban farm. Here in our vegetable garden, we're growing plants that have a very specific set of needs. Uh, they're tender plants, they're annual plants, they have shallow root systems. And so we're going to need to water very regularly in our vegetable garden. It could be every other day or every three days. Uh, and in the summer when we have heat waves, we might need to do additional irrigation just to keep them healthy and happy. Uh, we're also focused on production here. So in a lot of cases, the more we water these plants, the more they're going to produce. So these are all reasons that you want to have your vegetable garden on a separate station from anything else because they have a very specific water requirement. And we're using these drip tubing emitters on these, which again, uh, we've laid out in a way to, to spread a lot of water um, all over the surface of the beds. So all of these reasons, separate station for the vegetable garden. Here in our potted nursery area, we use these stake type emitters that put out a lot more water than any of the other drip type emitters that we have in our, in our farm. So these need to be definitely on a different station than the drip tubing emitter. We also have our plants here in pots ranging from these smaller tree pots to five gallon pots to 15 gallon pots. And we can't let our smallest size pot dry out, especially in the heat of the summer. You know, these pots can dry out really quickly. We're having to water these plants almost every day in the summer. So again, another reason that these potted plants cannot be on the same station as our vegetable garden or our California native garden or our orchard. Uh, they need to be on their own system. The other thing which we ran into with our, our potted nursery area over here is that we did actually run out of flow using these. We had this whole area against the fence attached to one station. And like I said, we have that 1,440 gallon per hour limit on how many stakes we can attach to this station. And we exceeded that as we expanded this station. So we just recently had to split this into two stations so that we could have enough flow for all of these emitters to run. 
Behind me is our native garden, and this garden is planted with exclusively California native plants, which can actually survive the entire summer without being irrigated. They can su survive just on rainwater. We, however, have installed an irrigation station for this area and just put a single sprinkler at the top of each of our hills. We're going to turn that station on only during the middle of summer when we have extreme heat to keep the plants a little bit green and to keep them from going completely dormant, which they would otherwise do. So again, this is a special planting area with special water requirements. These plants have really deep root systems. Uh, they're able to close their photosynthesis down to prevent water loss during the summer. So they're, in a very, they're very different in their water needs from the plants in our orchard, the plants in our vegetable garden, the plants in our nursery. So we're going to, again, put these plants on a separate station and water them completely uniquely uh, in our irrigation system. Here in our native nursery, we're actually right next to our native garden. But these plants in our nursery are growing in a very different situation. They are the same plants, but they're in one gallon pots, small pots. They don't have access to that deeper water, uh, that rainwater that would be held in the soil. Instead, they only have access to the water that's in the pots and they have shallower root systems. So these plants, if the pot were to dry out, they would die. And that's why these plants are on, again, a separate type of station. Here you can see the sprinklers running above me. And these sprinklers are running every two to three days in the summer, keeping these pots consistently moist. So same plants, but very different type of planting, very different situation. We also have the shade cloth up here to prevent some of that evaporation. So again, these plants are on a different station. Our greenhouses are watered with the same sprinklers that I showed you in our California native nursery, but we have these on a separate station for a couple different reasons. One, these plants need the humidity to be kept up. And so we do water these a little more regularly so that there's a lot of humidity in this greenhouse. We also water these in the winter because we have a covering over these uh, they don't get any rainwater. So we have to water these all through the winter, whereas in a native nursery, we don't need to water them because they get rain and it's relatively cool. So again, separate station for the greenhouse, even though we're using the same sprinklers. Here in our orchard, we have a variety of fruit trees planted from apricots to plums to jujubes to figs to sapotes. Uh, but one thing that's common is they're all trees. They're all gonna have very deep root systems. Uh, and we want them to have deep root systems because we're trying to make them drought resilient, especially here in Southern California. So in this area, we have our plants on, again, the same drip tubing that you would find in our vegetable garden, but we're irrigating them very differently. These plants actually get watered only once every two or three weeks, but they get a really deep soak. They might get a four hour or a five hour soak of irrigation. So that water settles deep into the soil and attracts the roots of these trees down deep. If we were to water them like we watered our vegetable garden where they're just getting a little bit, you know, half an hour of irrigation every two days, three days, their root systems would stay in that surface, you know, six to eight inches. And when that surface dried out, the tree would dry out. That's not what we want. We want these roots to come down deep. So we're watering them that way. We're watering them really deeply Again, like I said, four to five hours every two to three weeks. We are also uh, adjusting for the type of tree. So some trees like the apricot need more water. Some trees like the jujube or the fig can do with less water. And so we can still have those in the same station. We're just gonna put more tubing, more irrigation tubing with the emitters uh, by the apricot tree and less tubing by the jujube tree. So they'll get the same, the water will start at the same time, run for the same duration, but the jujube is gonna get less water. Even if you have the same type of planting in let's say your front yard and your backyard and they're far apart, that doesn't necessarily mean they need to be on a separate station. You can connect those together as long as you have enough flow to support both areas. So right here, I'm on my fruit tree hill, which is quite a distance from the apricot trees that I just showed you, but they're all connected together onto the same station. We also have in this area some California native plants. We've got a native milkweed right behind me, and we've got a native California bee plant right behind me here. 
And these plants can survive on less water. They could be in our exclusively California native garden and not get irrigated, but they're also fine with some regular additional irrigation, especially on these fruit tree stations where they're getting watered very irregularly. They're getting watered, like I said, every two or three weeks. So these plants are planted here under our guava trees and they do just fine. They don't need to be on a separate station. They're just picking up the water that the fruit trees are also picking up uh, on that same schedule. Let's say you have two plantings that are the same. Berries in one area, berries in another area, but one area is in full sun and the other area is in part shade, like where I'm standing here. Do those plantings need to be on the same station or a separate station? Well, it depends how you set it up. You could set them up on the same station and then just run less tubing in the shady area so the shady planting is getting less water. Or you could separate the stations, put the same amount of tubing, but then adjust the durations or the regularity of the shady station down so that it's getting less water. Both would work, both would probably work just fine. All right, that's about what you need to know to design your irrigation system and your stations. There's just a few things you wanna keep in mind as you're deciding what plants are gonna go on what station and how many stations you need to have. Remember, you don't wanna mix different types of emitters because different types of emitters can have very different flow rates. Uh, so potted plants where you're using a little stake that puts out a lot of water should not be on the same station as a drip tubing, which is putting out a very little amount of water. You also don't want to mix plants that need very different watering schedules. Fruit trees might not need to be watered uh, except for every two to three weeks. Vegetable garden is going to need to be watered every two to three days in the summer. So we don't want to be mixing uh, different plantings that need different watering schedules or you'll be over watering certain things. Okay, that's about it. Um, next, in the next video, I'm going to show you how to actually connect your irrigation valves together. Like I mentioned, every valve controls the station, but these valves are all connected to one water main, and you've got to build an irrigation manifold to connect the valves together. That's what we'll be doing in the next video. All right, I hope this series is slowly starting to demystify the very complicated seeming world of irrigation. There is a lot of different parts to these systems. There's a lot that you need to know, but we're going over it lesson by lesson, and we still have a couple lessons left in this series. So uh, I promise you, as long as you follow the steps of this series, you will understand how to put one of these systems together and get the same kind of success that we have here on our farm. So finally, remember, there's no garden too small, no soil too poor. This is the never ending gardening course.